I don't think I recognize you without your uh, your your shiny cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah, it's in a case ready to get on the road. <laughs> and so let's start from scratch. Let's start yeah. from like what you're working on right now, yep. or even before that, like yeah. your family. You know, yeah. when you met, yeah. you gave me such a great history, and I want that to be here for folks as well. Sure. My family are the Bundy Ranchers. If you do a Google search for Bundy Ranchers, you'll find all kinds of information. Yep. Uh, they're sort of the, I see them as the canaries in the coal mine of bad policy to uh, destroy our farmers and ranchers. Um, they first uh, became infamous in 2014, and then they stood up for some more wrongdoings again in 2016. Uh, I'm the city slicker cousin, which is, Get what what that's actually done is given me the ability to speak urban and rural, right? Like I said, I, I grew up in a small town when I was growing up called St. George, Utah, and okay. then never left my sphere until I joined the Army, and then I got exposed to cult, different cultures around the country, yep. um, and then after getting home from a, a deployment to Iraq, I end up in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and living the city life, which I did not like in the least, uh, mm -hmm. but it's where life took me and leaving Arizona, coming back to Southern Utah, getting back into, you know, my, my uncle told me a long time ago, if you want to be a millionaire rancher, start with 10. And so in my mind, because I didn't inherit the ranch, right? If, if my mom was my dad, I would have inherited a ranch, but <laughs> my mom married a guy from the city. So that's how it went. So, uh, but I wanted to be ranching. I wanted to be in agriculture. I really loved the lifestyle they were living. And so now I got to go find a way to make millions of dollars so that I can get into agriculture. Okay. Well, those other avenues kept going in ways that they shouldn't have or didn't work. And so finally, I'm like almost 40 and I'm like, screw it. Instead of dancing around the ultimate vision, let me just go get into agriculture. And so I called my cousin and I said, can I sell beef? for your ranch direct to consumer. And this was 2019. Okay. And he's a, he's a cow calf rancher. He's in the Nevada desert. Mm -hmm. um, a chunk of his land, he has to call on a special radio to get permission to go on. Cause it's owned by the air force. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, and, uh, but the good thing about that, if over time, I'm hoping to encourage him with, you know, holistic management, they don't care what he does on that chunk because they're the, they're the air force. They're like, we don't care. Just, make sure we're, we know when you're coming on, on property. I'm like, man, if you knew the opportunity you had, yes. because he doesn't have the BLM telling him you can only have one cow per 100 acres. Exactly. So, exactly. Anyway. So I start selling for him end of 2019 momentum starting to gain. We're selling monthly subscriptions so that we have a monthly reoccurring revenue. We can anticipate our growth and it's going well. And then COVID hits. Mm hmm so we called to schedule our next round of processing and they said, yes, we can get you in 18 months. And it was like, what? And that was where I first got exposure to the danger of a, of our centralized food supply chain. Yep. Because everything has been built for, as you know, just in time delivery because they've maximized efficiency to maximize the profit, not what's sustainable or something that can be repeatable over time. So yeah, 18 months. Well, you're trying to sell and maintain a regular business. There's no way. You mean, no. Peter, you're waiting for your order next week and I can't get slaughter for 18 months. And so yeah. we drove all over the state of Utah, fitting our cattle into any place we could get it in. Yeah. And so now with the margins already as small as they were, now we've lost all the margins because I'm driving all over Utah, just picking up what I can had my first, it was weird. I had my first breakdown, mm -hmm. like mental breakdown, driving mm -hmm. home with a load of beef that was thawing because I had it under layers of, of, uh, uh, sleeping bags, just trying to insulate it. Cause we usually didn't have to drive that far. So we didn't have the infrastructure like a freezer trailer or a reefer truck. Jesus. And so oh, I've man. got this valuable product and uh, a, an animal that's sacrificed its life to provide nourishment starting to spoil. And I just broke. And I'm like, what? I've been in Iraq and I had I did not have nearly the amount of emotional breakdown ever that I did dealing with this. So hey. 
Anyway, uh, during that time, it was actually April 2020, I'm driving down the road and I'm hearing the, the news talk about empty store shelves and limitations on what people can buy at a time. Yep. And I see fat cattle standing in the field all around me. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is broken. There's mm -hmm. a better way to do this. There's a way that doesn't starve people because they can't access it because it's coming from 3,000 miles away. Right. Somebody should build, this is how I was thinking, somebody should build the Airbnb of local food so that you can go on and no matter where you're at, this map shows everybody around you who's got food products for sale. Well, at the time, because things weren't going so well, I was throwing concrete when I could. I was driving for Instacart, you know, because I'd just gone through a bankruptcy that brought me home. So I was in the transition and then COVID hit. And so I'm still trying to transition. It was pretty, pretty wild. Yep. And I know nothing about software. So that's a good idea. Somebody should do that. And I tried <laughs> to push it off. Yep. I even called, I found a recording. I called, a, I messaged a buddy on LinkedIn who just graduated as a full stack software developer. And I'm like, hey, okay. there's this thing I think you should hear that is, is absolutely needed. And uh, I want to share it with you. So I, I ended up get, connecting with him and he was not interested. It wasn't his inspiration. And so he's like, and he, had, and he has no connection to the space. So of course, why would he yeah. even bother? Yep. Well, I'm like, well, I tried and I kind of pushed it off to the side. Well, I couldn't sleep for weeks. Just thinking about it. Yeah. And when I laid my head down at night, I would picture this man in Iraq who watched us feed his family because we had care packages sent out. And I'm seeing myself as him watching other people feed my children. And so I couldn't sleep for weeks. Like this has to be done. This has to be done. Now this was, you know, early on. So as far as I knew, I was the only one who could see that this needed to be done and was, and that there was a path for this. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just, I couldn't sleep. And and I have now since realized and and am fully aware that it was God who put this idea mm -hmm. that I had to go step forward and do something about it. Um, and even though I'm the last guy he should probably ask, because I know nothing about software. Mm -hmm. Now, over the last four years, I've recognized that was my life and experience as a city slicker cousin. You know, I got teased as that. I used that phrase because I was teased as a, as the cousin. You're just the city slicker. And I hated that because I wanted to be like my my cousins. They were, my, you know, my small town, my friends were my cousins, right? We, the, the Bundys, their family reunion every year, we have 1,100 people. They're all family. It's a huge posterity. And so... They were there. That's my that's my clan. Right. And so them teasing me being different was frustrating. But now as an adult, recognizing the life experiences I went through was because producers don't know how to speak to the urban community and the urban community don't know how to find the producers. Yep. So their ships pass in the night and yet they're wholly reliant on each other for their lives. Producers must have that revenue to keep producing and yep. consumers must have the producers to keep eating. And we don't and the know. More you, the more you connect them directly, the more money goes to the producer. Yes, exactly. And so selling for my cousin and realizing that 14 to 30 cents on the dollar is all he's earning because of all the steps in between, that's where it started to come together that if we build a platform, that its sole purpose is to be the messenger and connect the two, then we can collectively through small commissions. So basically we said, I said, how can we flip that dollar split so that the 10 to uh, the 14 to 30 cents is what goes into the getting people to the food. And mm -hmm. then the producer gets the rest. Yeah. And maybe over time, the cost of food can go down because we've created more abundance. Yep. So that's what we've done. So we've built a platform called from the farm. So I, I end up saying, I can't sleep. Let me go find somebody. And I found my my partner now, the first guy I talked to, who built the software as a service, who also has some ties into ag. And mm -hmm. he's like, that's a good idea, but you got some market, re you got some research to do. And that was April, 2020. Mm -hmm. You know, overnight success, 10 years in the making. Three yep. years and three and a half. And I know watching your story, I'm like, oh man, this guy's been going at it for a long time. You know? That's right. <laughs> Not just, oh, I start seeing you on social media. Oh, brand new. No, you've been working for a long time. Yeah. So it's been, it was three and a half years of 
interviewing and asking questions because I didn't want to build what I thought was right or going to mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. We're going to do this. We need to build what the producers tell me will work because everybody's showing up with different offers. You know, we've got a CRM that will help you. We've got this widget that will help you. We've all these different things. Mm -hmm. I don't know that any of them have ever asked what will actually help you. And mm. what we learned was the marketing is the worst part of going direct. Yeah. The second worst part is getting it to them. But yeah. those are the two most yeah. time consuming and, and frankly, things that require skills that I don't have time to do. I'm in the field from the time before the sun is up and I'm out there until the sun goes down. And now I'm going to go park my butt in front of a computer and learn how to work algorithms and figure out keywords and Google that. No, that's, I yeah. don't have the capacity to do that. As so, a farmer, you're speaking as a farmer, as right? A farmer, as a farmer, yeah. a rancher, a homesteader, you don't have the time or capacity to take that on. So yeah. you're stuck in the commodity market and maybe through word of mouth selling a little bit with a better margin. But you're 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 selling if you're not doing that, you're selling to these big companies yep. that are squeezing you, squeezing you, squeezing you. Yep. And that's yep. a stressful situation. So with your with your Airbnb for producers and consumers, yeah. where yeah. where is that right now? So we're we're live. We launched in March. We have Okay. When I met you. Yeah. Yeah. Is we this were, is this the shake the hand that feeds you? Is that yeah. what this is? Yeah. That's our that's our slogan. So it's from the farm. Uh right now it's dot io. Soon it'll be dot org. So from the farm dot org dot com was fifty thousand dollars. So we just Org is recognizable enough for most people. <laughs> so uh, we've got 68 ranchers in the process of onboarding. I think 30 that are live. We've done over $10,000 in transactions, which was really neat because it came from people all over the country, buying from different producers all over the country. Mm -hmm. And we also designed the software to where you, the consumer, can shop however many producers you want at, and check out one time. And the money goes to the producers it belongs to. We had to we had to understand consumer behaviors, which is convenience. Mm -hmm. I can go to the grocery store, get my milk, get my dairy, get my produce, get my grain, and yep. leave. If I've got to go to a platform and check out, and then check out, and then, uh, they're yep. not going to stay. Yep. So we designed that intentionally so we can start offering that convenience. But but you can shake the hand that feeds you and get everything you need right from the producers. We only we only take a ten to fifteen percent commission on mm -hmm. what we've sold. That collective commission goes to the collective marketing to drive traffic, just like Airbnb, to the platform. Our ultimate goal is to help spur a new agrarian movement, similar to what Airbnb did with short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Short-term rentals would have not existed that the volume they have if somebody didn't do the marketing for anybody that wanted to participate, right? If I wanted to rent my room out, but it was on me to go and do the Facebook ads and do the marketing and all that kind of stuff, it just yep. wouldn't have been realistic. Yep. But they've made it so simple. We want to do the same because there are so many people wanting to leave the city or the, or the, the suburbs in out of their cubicle and go back on the land. Mm -hmm. But th there's so many pieces in play there. Well, if they're like, Oh, well, the marketing is done and actually there's a demand that's not being met because there's not enough farmers. If we just show up and start growing food, there's a customer base waiting for us. Yeah. We're hoping that that's what we can help create. So how are you dealing with the lack of small processors, small meat processors around the country? That's a bottleneck for so many of these smaller producers who just want to sell directly. To and That's where it actually gets expensive. Yes. It's cheaper to produce if you're doing it regeneratively. We haven't even talked about regenerative production. Yes. So we'll talk about that too. Yeah. 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 On the on the processing side. So during that three and a half years of research, I found myself running a USDA slaughterhouse in Cody, Wyoming. Okay. Who would have told me that in the process? I would have not, I wouldn't even start it because there's no way I can what I don't know anything about slaughterhouses. And even right. the way I landed there was by necessity, not by design. Yep. You know, and so that exposed me to the slaughterhouse issues that we have in yep. our nation, where we've only got like 10,000 uh, state and federal inspected left in our whole country. So yep. it's just as big of a problem. So 
when I first had this, you know, vision, I'm like, great, I can deal with bit, uh, bits and not atoms. That's way easier to deal with the, you know, stuff in the ether versus the physical, the physical side, the transportation, the meat. The, so I thought I had a really clever business model that would let, allow me to, you know, kind of skate by and make it a little easier on myself. And then I got exposed to the slaughterhouse problem and realized that we can't do that. If we're committed to this mission, how do we help that? And so I've started talking to groups like Friesla. Friesla makes modular processing facilities that can be built within 90 days. They're USDA, they're all built to USDA standards and specs. They come from Washington. They're there because they're modular. They can ship it on a few semis, drop the containers, and they're ready to go. Wow. Their smallest product will do 25 head a day or a week, and it's only 1.2 million. So that's a really good price for a slaughterhouse to add that processing. So what we will do as we grow and as we have the resources where necessary, if we have to, if somebody else steps in and handles this side of it, great, but we will drop processing facilities throughout the country where they're needed to help fulfill that need mm -hmm. if we're successful and have the revenue to do that. Regenerative production, regenerative grass finished meats. Are you yes. focused on that or not focused on that? When I started, that's all I was focused on. And then I recognized that in order to help with a transition, you have to meet them where they're at and not vilify them for what they're doing. Yep. But by relation, they'll start seeing like, oh, my neighbor's saving six figures in inputs, which goes into his bank account. How do I do that? It's right. Very similar to what you're telling in the story of Roots So Deep, right? That's, that's why I love it because you have those two people right next to each other and it's like, brilliant. That's our same method of getting people to regenerate because you know as well as I do that re that regenerative agriculture truly what that means is it gives you sovereignty as a producer you don't need all of the external inputs that are mm -hmm. keeping you held captive to a system that is crumbling mm -hmm. that's to me that's the not the biggest value but at the human level that's the biggest value of regenerative agriculture to the to the family yep. right to all of us it's the better environment the better food the better health and and so forth but to that individual family, it's their sustainability and being able to keep doing what they're doing because I don't need to bring in fertilizer. I don't need to finish on corn and grain. I've got a friend in Tremont in Utah who's been doing regenerative agriculture for five years. Now he cuts all of his winter, his first growing, and that feeds his livestock through the winter. So he's not buying feed. And his product is incredible. And now landowners are firing their people that are leasing and moving that to him because of the impact, like he's gaining more acreage because of they're like, Hey, I want you to do on my place, what you did on that guy's place. And now he's picking up more lease ground because of the impact. Because so, he's focusing on soil health and yep. all the things we talk about with regenerative, his business is growing. Yes. Yes. So I, I am a, in my house, we eat regenerative beef. That's what we eat. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we will have a corn and grain finished steak uh, you know, at special occasions, but we will never have it if I don't know the rancher it came from. So like if I'm going to a restaurant and I, I ask the, and I do, I'll ask the waiter, where's it from? If they can't tell me, I'll get something else on the menu. Now I am aware that the pork or the chicken on the menu doesn't have an origin story, but our last chance to fight is on the beef side. So I won't buy, I won't support beef that doesn't have an origin story. Okay. Uh, so, okay. so, then along with the, the regenerative side as well, it's knowing that that's what's going to make a difference for the reversal of desertification. And I live in the West and desertification is what we're seeing. When when my family settled the Arizona Strip in 1916, they were, it was some of the last homesteading available in the lower 48. They said it's north side of the Grand Canyon. It's called Bundyville. They, the government said, here's a chunk of land. If anybody wants it, good luck. You know, it was, it was host, not hostile in terms of 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 other humans but just formidable environment mm -hmm. well their their journals say that grass was stirrup high and they could drive right. yeah they could dry farm corn and cotton and potatoes dry farm and had no problem five years after they settled the rain cycles stopped they couldn't grow things like they could and they did not know what was happening so they all had to move back to town Mm -hmm. And so understanding regenerative principles and how what leads to desert desertification, I mean, I was all in, you know, I saw Alan Savory's TED talk first, 
Mm -hmm. And then Kiss the Ground came out right away. This is all happening kind of the same time. Yep. For me personally, the way I was raised, I didn't think about the environment. You know, that was a liberal thing, blah, blah, blah. Yep. I sat with Mother Aya and that changed my whole, uh, Mother Aya being ayahuasca. And that opened my heart to nature, which I was not prepared for. And mm -hmm. the fa first phase of that was desertification's happening. We're screwed. I'm going to watch my kids starve to death. Because I had come from a place called Iraq that used to be a wetland, my, my, it, primarily. Most people don't know this. Iraq was a wetland and Saddam Hussein dammed off all of the water tributaries so that he could dry it out and see his enemy as far out as he could see. Jesus. And so I'm like, holy crap, we're going to see this in America and my family's going to starve to death. So now I'm freaked out. Well, then when I saw Alan Savory's TED talk and saw that there was a possibility of a different future mm -hmm. and what we, what we do in mother nature in a hundred years, she'll turn around in five, you know, she's like, hold my beer and watch this. And then just <laughs> completely transforms what we thought was lost. Yeah. You know, so uh, we even bought four. Uh, there's a, a small group of us. There's three of us that bought 60 acres in this place called the Escalani Desert in Utah. Mm -hmm. it is, it's it's greasewood and sagebrush. It's trash ground. Anybody looking at that will say worthless. But the Escalani, the Catholic Escalani Party in their journals in the 1700s said that this was the most beautiful land they'd ever seen in all their travels. Wow. And so I'm like, no. We, and and by the way, three years ago, there was so much rain that it knocked over a locomotive train driving through the desert. The rain is there. They just don't know how to man, manage it. Capture it. it. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so regenerative, you know, then I find out, like I've been listening to a guy named Neil Spackman all the time, you know, with what he did in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia at the Albaida Project. And yeah. I was like talking about, I don't know if you've heard of him, but I was talking about him. On a phone call, my wife's like, wait, what's his name? And I told her, she's like, AJ, he's married to my cousin. And I was like, I mean, this guy is like John Liu, Alan Savory. I mean, he's up there. He took this whole area of the Saudi Arabia desert and transformed it by managing the rainfall coming off of the watershed. Mm -hmm. And it's wild. I mean, and now he's got Regenerative Resource Co. as his company. And they're building regenerative shrimp farms to to repair mangroves along coastal lines nice but what i learned from him in his experience at saudi arabia was if we don't solve for the financial side you're mm -hmm. not going to get people to change what they're doing the right. reason the mangroves were wiped out is because they're destitute and they needed the firewood to cook or to sell so the only way to have people shift what they're doing is if they can see the value of the financial reward to care for their family, not to make millions, but just to, to, to be doing yep. what they're doing. And yep. so that, that is what fed like, okay, I really want to push regenerative agriculture. But when I would, the city slicker nephew, you know, you're always seven to your family a saying I've heard. So here I show up like, Hey guys, listen, our family said it was this way. If you change the way you're doing, it'll go this way. And they're just looking at me like I'm nuts. And so I'm like, wait a minute, if I can affect the economics, mm -hmm. then they're going to want to learn more. That's yeah. where I can, and they're not going to learn it from me because I'm not a rancher. But if I'm, if they're side by side with Braden McMurdy and his family who are saving, you know, well into the six figures of inputs, mm -hmm. now my cousin or uncle or whoever's going to be like, this guy's a rancher. He's doing really, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. It's got to come from them as you very well know. I thought the way, the way you paired, you were able to find two people doing two different practices and bring them together so they could have that open conversation was so well done. Common ground served a really great purpose to promote this to a more urban liberal community. All right. That's necessary. Yep. But any rancher I know will turn it off in the first 30 minutes. Oh, okay. They like, Brooke and I were, I mean, we, I already saw it prior to the Austin event, but again, I was just like, gosh, dang, it's way too like white man killed the Indian. And that's the reason for all the problems. Right. And just in a very like sum it up how they're get how they're going to hear it. Uh, even kiss the ground was a little bit too much for many of my family. Like mm -hmm. these, these are generational roots deep into 
ag being what it has been for the last, you know, hundred years, that even that was a little too, uh, I'll just use the term liberal, but there's a, there's more context to that, right? A little bit too left leaning for the producer. Okay. And, and it also goes to kind of like what I was saying earlier, they, a lot of them don't know that the organizations supporting them have been captured. And so their the producers, their, yeah, their grandpa was trained by land grant universities from the NRCS or what, you know, graduates from, from land grant universities. So, so these were the guys who showed up with some magic fairy dust that tripled their crops. Like that's gotta be a good thing. And so, which is called nitrogen fertilizer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. that nitrogen fertilizer, it, uh, he didn't know any better. He didn't know what it was doing to the microbes in the ground. Right. And, sure. and, uh, I've even had this conversation with one of my uncles. I'm like, what makes a good cow? And he's like, genetics and feed. I'm like, what makes good feed? Good soil. I'm like, what makes good soil? Well, I don't know. That's where it ends. And I'm like, wouldn't you, if you're maximizing your skills in an industry, want to know all of that? Yeah. And so that I didn't ask that question. It was just something I've been processing, you know? Yep. So the, the, the approach that you guys took with bringing two people that are in the industry from opposite sides to the mm -hmm. table to have that conversation mm -hmm. and learn from each other, that will melt bridges or uh, that, uh, that will build bridges. I should say between you're, you you meant to say that'll melt walls, melt walls, build bridges. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it will because it's not you telling them. It's not me telling them it's, a producer who is doing it a certain way, talking with his neighbor producer who isn't, and you have very clear examples of the benefits, mm -hmm. you know, especially with the birds. Like my favorite bird is the is the uh, pheasant. Just okay. its look, it, it reminds me of, you know, the the 50s when my grandpa would hunt after World War II. And like just it, there's something about that. There's a there's a childhood nostalgia to that bird. And so anyway. Mm -hmm. I thought that's how that's how you start making this shift is the guy who used to do it this way, kind of like Will Harris, right? Will Harris is so great at this because he was commodity producer yep, and knew all the science and knew why you did it that way. And it all made perfect sense until it didn't. Didn't and feel so, right to him. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. I loved that. And, and I think you found great people, the people that you're talking to, the families that are involved in there, they're, they're phenomenal. They're really, they're, they're, uh, they're likable. So if you're not in production, you're, you can hear from them, you know, some of the problems with producers and my family are kind of them. They speak to other producers, right. they don't speak to the consumer. And I'm like, yo, like, <laughs> matter of fact, I had a phone call with, with uh, one of my cousins when the whole thing was going on at the Oregon uh, bird sanctuary with the federal government surrounding them and so forth. Like I, yep. I called him and I said, Hey, I'm in a self-development conference in LA. Like this was when it was the dominating news story. Yep. And somehow this was affecting all these people's lives. And so they were at the microphone talking about this. I'm like, first of all, I was thought it was weird. Like how is this affecting your life? But, but you've made it that, you know? Right. Yeah. But what I was aware of is that, you're trying to get people to see the policies that are destroying their food supply, but you're speaking producer language. Mm -hmm. They already get it. You got to talk to the consumer to get them to vote differently. Yeah. And so the messaging is so crucial. And um, anyway, so I kind of just offered that for him to consider. And then it, it was his rodeo and he's going to, he's going to do however he chooses there. But I just wanted him to be aware of what I was hearing yep. because I've gone through self-development and communication training. So I understand the psychology uh, on, on that level and how to communicate so people can, that it'll resonate, you know? Yep. When we made our film Carbon Nation, we went on tour in, 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 in Utah and we had a screening down in St. George. And I had my nephews with me, my brother's boys and, and our young son, Clay, and our other son hadn't been created yet. Yeah. And uh, he might have been created in St. George. <laughs> and and um, and we had a screening of, of, of our film Carbonation, which is about 90 minutes. And the Q&A went for over two and a half hours. It was just like, like they started vacuuming the, the auditorium, you know, like. 
Here's the but signal. Was, We're trying to get out of here. But that's when you when you've made a film, any filmmaker will tell you this and you have a Q&A. How many people stick around for the Q&A? Right. And then how long does it go if it isn't artificially constrained by the fact that they're going to give you 20 minutes and you got to get out of there? And so I St. George, it's beautiful there, too, man. It's freaking gorgeous. Yeah. It's also it's is also, Zion. Isn't Zion just yeah. to the east? Yeah. Like 45 minutes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gorgeous. It's also a, a case study for what happens when we turn farmland into houses. Like the desertification uh, down there is so sad. Yeah. As a kid, you'd see storm clouds come off the Black Hills and they'd come into town and they'd water town. But now yep. all the farmland is shingles and pavement. And so now you see it come off the Black Hills and it goes. Whoosh. It just splits around. Yep. Or it it hammers right north of town and we get flash floods. Right. And right. The solution is zero scaping. And I'm like, no, yeah. that is the that's going to accelerate the problem. Your solution actually would be prairie scaping. You should consider yeah. that as front yard landscape. Yeah, I, I, I joke that, you know, everybody that I know, we want to terraform Earth. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's give that a shot. I yeah. mean, let's Mars, whatever. Yeah. Let's terraform this place first. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah, and so um, what was I going to ask you? I was going to ask you something. So tell me the name of your website again. You said it's .io right now, but you're going to change yeah. it to .org? Yep. It's from the farm. From the farm. Yep. Our, mate, our primary focus is, and the only thing that will keep us from not being successful is not having producers to serve. Okay. We are at a 100% sign up if they're referred to me. If I cold call them because I know who I'm calling and I know the mentality on the other side, it goes nowhere. But if somebody says, you really should check out what these guys are doing mm -hmm. because of what we're doing and because of our, our ethics and our morals, we are at 100% sign up. There is no contract. I think you should be selling on every platform you possibly can because the key is that you're sold out. And that gives me the responsibility to go be the guy that sells you out. Yeah. We take a very small commission only on things that we've already sold. We right. do have a we do have a premium subscription that nobody's paying for because we haven't brought the value yet. And the sole purpose of that is to be able to verify our farms because you're not allowed to sell unless you're family owned or privately owned or operated. Yep. No, no corporate white labels to preserve what we're building. Yep. Um, we are never selling. When God said build this, he also said you can't build it to exit. Because we have an opportunity. To oh, I see what you're saying. You're, ne you're never going to sell the company. No. Gotcha. Makes it hard to find money, but but this whole thing is hard. So whatever, just add one more hard it, thing. And, and just, if, if these things were easy, everyone would be doing it. Yeah. If you knew how hard it was going to be, you wouldn't have started. That's how all my projects are. Who, <laughs> yeah, right. Who knew I'd be working a decade on something? Like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why we're crowdfunding. Because I cannot, I, 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 our three board of directors were people with me four years ago and was nothing, just an idea. And they knew from the, because I told them then we need to build this and it can never be sold. Cause that was very clear. However, I downloaded that message that this is the opportunity that your grandkids will have farms, family owned farms and ranches. Yep. So you cannot do it for the money. The money is simply a byproduct of, of, have an integrity with what we're building. So yep. you can't be on the board because I can't have JBS show up with a billion dollar check to buy us and have anybody influenced by that. Um, and so we also can't raise money from venture capital because their goal is an exit. Right. We raised half a million, uh, $550,000 two months ago. Wow. I sold them on not investing and they invested. I said, we're never selling. So your, re your return's only going to be through dividends or other ancillary ways we find to make revenue. Mm -hmm. um, you can't have a seat on the board. And every lobbyist in the nation working for Big Food and Big Pharma will come after us with everything they've got as soon as we start taking any sliver of their market share. Right. So are you in? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the guys I was pitching to also had some callings that they were called to. And one of them's built two slaughterhouses in Utah already because of that. And right. so they're like, and I think that that's why they invested. It was because of our morals, our ethics, and our commitment to what we were doing. Yeah. So 
So yeah, the only, the only, our main focus is if, because everything I hear right now is there's nobody in my area, right? Because I'm on social and social media isn't geographically targeted. Right. Where most of my ranchers are in the Rocky Mountain West. And I've got, uh, Will Harris came on board right away. I pitched this to Will Harris 10 years ago and he goes, AJ, if you can do this, you figured out what I've been trying to solve for 10 years. Nice. He said, there's no reason I'm shipping anything out of Georgia. Atlanta's three hours away. Millions of people. I can only serve 25,000 a year. How am I selling anything out of Atlanta when I'm only servicing roughly 25,000 clients? Are you keeping your your sales regional like Will's that, theory? Or the you... ultimate goal is hyper-local. That is what we're working towards. Got it. We can't do that until we bring on producers. So right now it's like, okay, buy direct. That's the first step. Even mm -hmm. if you have to have it shipped, support the local rancher. Yep. Uh, the, yep. Support the support the family-owned operation. Yep. Then the next step is to get these producers on throughout the nation so that we can start the localization. So then it'll become more regional. You know, mm -hmm. my first goal, my first big goal is that you can order from somewhere and it never comes further within further than two-day ground. Right. Right. Then and that's going to work with refrigeration. It's going to work with all yep. sorts of things. Yep. Yeah. The cost of, of, of fulfillment goes way down, right? Will said the new middleman is UPS and FedEx, right? Right. And you've got the box and the insulation and the dry ice and so forth. Well, those are all margins coming off of what the producer earns. So uh, the, the more closer we can get. So if I wave my magic wand and what we've envisioned exists like the Airbnb, mm -hmm. whatever town you're in, there's almost the simplicity of a direct exchange, or in other words, a reusable package, like the milkman of old, right? Yes. I've got, yes. A, I've got a freezer bag. I hand it full. You hand me it back. And we're just swapping every week or every two weeks, whatever our order cycle is. That's, that's our, that's our long-term vision. It has to be hyper-localized because that's yep. what's sustainable. Yep. And then we stop building farmland and keeping it farmland, but farmland has to be profitable in order for people to keep it. Yeah, just like the mangroves. Doom and gloom is not my game. Yeah. 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 We're we're here to celebrate. We're here to show solutions. Yes. AJ, great to see you, man. Likewise, Peter. I'm I'm so grateful for this time with you. I know you're yeah. busy and uh we'll uh, have to stay connected and see how I can keep supporting. Dude, we are connected.